Well, the, the update is that, that Teddy is uh, in the building. Uh, Teddy has entered the building, but he, we don't know exactly where in the building he is yet, but he'll be shortly uh, here. So we're going to get started. I have with me the illustrious Andre Harrell, founder of Uptown, works at Revolt. As well. How are you doing today? Uh, my name is Zach O'Malley-Greenberg. Uh, I am the media and entertainment editor at Forbes, and we are here today to talk about New Jack Swing. So. Andre, why don't we begin by, you know, kind of defining the terms, right? How, what does New Jack Swing mean to you in terms of a genre? Okay. Um, I'm going to, before I define the term, I'm going to tell you how I met Teddy Riley first. I met Teddy Riley up in the Apollo Theater. He used to play uh, keyboards for uh, his, his uh, uncle-in-law, Omar Chandler. Omar Chandler was a recording artist on MCA Records. So I would see Teddy playing these keyboards, and he was like 12 years old. Then time would pass. I would see him, he's 14, 15, playing for other people. And then um, Dougie Fresh came out with the show. And I had never heard anything like that in my life, and I knew it was Teddy Riley. And he combined go-go music with hip-hop music, fused it with funk, and created music that sounded so new and so fresh it created a whole fashion lifestyle, the whole bit. So I had known Teddy for about eight years, no, seven years before I started working with him. And I always knew he was going to be something. But I didn't know he was going to turn around and create a whole culture worth of music. All right. And, uh, and tell me about your beginnings in the music business as well. I started out as a rap artist. I was in a group called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on Profile Records. I write some Dot Circle Mr. High fans. So I was on the same label as Run DMC before Run DMC. And I came out of hip hop um, from the Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five era. Like we were rapping in the streets in the park in the Bronx. And uh, we didn't have hit records then. We just had to hold the crowd's attention so there wouldn't be no fights, no shootouts. So if there was a fight, you couldn't even put the mic down. You had to keep rapping because if, you, if there was a fight, and you put the mic down, then everybody would panic. Because sometimes the fights were isolated over here. So these people didn't see it. So we just kept rocking, kept rocking. So by the time I made a record, one of my first records for Genius Rap, it was off the Tom Tom Club, uh, Genius of Love. Dun, 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 dun. So by the time I had a hit record and I walked out into the audience and they was already clapping, that was a new thing to me. I didn't have to work that hard to get people to go. And um, from there, I just thought to myself, I took LL Cool J out on a, uh, a show. I was working at Rush Management. And they didn't have a road manager for LL Cool J. So they asked me to do it. So I took him to this uh, small theater in Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey. And he had um, my radio. That was his first record. And when he got up there, the girls were screaming for him like he was new addition. And I had never seen Screaming Girl fans. OK, Teddy Riley's here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now we can begin. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Well, Andre was just talking about how the two of you guys met uh, to begin with. And, uh, but, but you know, now, now the audience knows what he said. So you, know, you don't know what he said. So now we can kind of test the, the, the versions of both sides of it. So, what is your recollection of how you guys first got together? Well, um, what I remember is uh, Andre coming to the rooftop, and we had rooftop records. And uh, I think it was around the time we did the uh, Kumo D album. You were 15 years old, and you were in a group called The, the First Impressions. That's right. And you were making the music at the rooftop. Around the same but, time. Yeah, but, was, but, was, but I met you. With Omar Chandler, when you used to play keyboards at the Apollo. There you go. <laughs> but my, I, I, the, the time that I pointed out was when we started doing business. You know, we started doing a bunch of stuff together, and that was uh, Rooftop Records. And you came there, and you bought Heavy, and you bought the crew, and it was like, uh, we want to work on some music. And we were already doing, you know, a bunch of stuff, Keith Sweat, and, and, uh, in fact, it wasn't Keith Sway, it was uh, Kumo D, it was uh, Kids at Work. Ah. 
my group with yeah. Timmy Gatlin okay. and Corel. That's right. And uh, from then, well, what's we the had, name of the kids at work record? It was the singing Hey Yeah. We did it with Heavy. Remember? Don't okay. you know? Okay. So uh, we were working on Kumo D. It was the time there was a robbery and some guys came into the uh, rooftop. Now let me give you some background on the rooftop. The rooftop is on 155th Street in Harlem, right next door to where they have Pro Rucker. And, and the guy who owned the rooftop, Gusto, was a reformed gangster who had bought a roller rink. And their studio was in the roller rink. And the time he's talking about, I'll let you take it from there. Well, this is a place where, you know, everybody went to hang out. It was the roller skating ring, but it was also a hangout for like the hustlers. So if you really wanted to find somebody and most of the shooting and everything was up that way, but you know, we still dealt with it because that's what that's how we lived and you know, we did it just for doing our music and we were so eager to be at the studio. So Rooftop was the only studio until Andre Harrell came and he introduced me to a whole new world of studios like Chung King. Chung King is where Run DMC, uh, Beastie uh, Boys, Rick, Def Jam, Rick Rubin, Rick Rubin, everybody did everything. And, you know, we kind of came in second with the whole Uptown and, and, and Andre introducing me to everybody. And then I just started working with everybody from the label, from Finesse and Sequence, um, the girls, mm -hmm. Groupie Chill, mm -hmm. um, I'll Be Sure, mm -hmm. and Heavy D. Mm -hmm. So the first artist he put me on was Heavy D. And I ripped it. I just, I did everything. You made Mr. Big Stuff. Yes. But, well, I, I can't take full credit because Eddie F, Eddie Eddie Kyle West, you know, we were a tag team. And whatever I couldn't do, which was probably... I did everything. You did everything. You know, they would they would always work on the records first, and then they would pass it to me and ask me what I would do to it, and and I would just go in on the record, and we got Mr. Big Stuff, Overweight Lover, and then we got uh, I'll Be Sure, Off on Your Own, and uh, Ooh This Love, and uh, and uh, what was it? I can tell you how I, I feel about you. Night and day. How I feel. Yeah. Night and day. So I started working on all of these records and. Next thing you know, Andre just said, you get you in. We get ready to put you on a whole bunch of other stuff. And then next thing, I was signing Guy. And uh, that changed the game. That changed the game. I remember when um, I had Guy, and we had the first single. It was called Groove Me. And, uh, and I remember listening to Groove Me like, oh my God, this is it. I already had Hef D. I had a, oh, I'll be sure. So I was popping, but Groove Me was was tribal or something. And so I would play it for my friends. I played for Russell Simmons. I played for different record people. And that they wouldn't get it. And when they didn't get it, it let me know, oh, y'all going to be about two years behind me because this is about to go. Exactly. <laughs> that record, actually, remember when Timmy Regisford took us to London? Mm -hmm. And then we went to Amsterdam. And we debuted the record in Amsterdam in this big club. Nothing but ladies, lasers going all over the place. And they played the record for the first time. And I can remember the people just going crazy. They didn't know what it was. They thought it was a DJ playing just some stuff that, they, that he put together. And they were going all over that record. And then next thing you know, we got back to America. And the record came out on that Friday. And uh, Dre didn't wait. It was like, it's got to go. It's got to come out. When it came out, we did our first appearance. And at our first appearance, we went with uh, Johnny Kemp because we had finished that record as well. Johnny Friday Kemp night just, just got, got paid. paid. That record was supposed to be on the, the Keith Sweat album, mm -hmm. but it was too late. He mastered the record, and then we had to give it to someone. So we gave it to Johnny Kemp. The same thing with My Prerogative was supposed to be on the Guy album, but it was the last record. Actually, the last record was You Can Call Me Crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a secret to tell. <laughs> you Can Call Me Crazy was a record sung by I'll Be Sure. And I'll Be Sure did the record. We finished it with him. And then we needed one more record. And uh, 
when you guys had that altercation, you know, the argument, and I was like, wait a minute. Gene was like, we need another record, and we taking, you can call me crazy. At the same time, Timmy Gatlin sung the first verse, and then Gene called Timmy Gatlin out of the studio, and next thing you know, Timmy Gatlin walked back in and said, I quit. I quit the group, and we didn't have a singer. So we wound up keeping I'll Be Sure's vocal on the Guy album. So you might as well say I'll Be Sure is a part of Guy. <laughs> and uh, umpteen years later, you know, I always want the truth to be told. Um, the other thing was um, when that altercation came out in the uh, rooftop, I wound up staying with Andre in Brooklyn at the uh, office. I had, and a, and I had a two floor condo in Brooklyn. I wound up staying there. Hang on to it? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> staying there was like school to me. You know, I learned everything I needed to know as far as the record business and, you know, the lifestyle of Uptown because they were the only ones doing it that way, you know, really turning things around. If we had a record, we didn't wait, you know. You and Diddy was like the fastest, Bring it to the the club. fastest to put out any record. Bring it to the club. That was yeah. hot. L let me back it up a minute, just to make sure that everybody fully understands, because uh, I think, I don't know, how many, how many uh, New Yorkers here in the audience? Okay, how many, non, uh, the rest of you non-New Yorkers, how many Texans? Okay. Um, so yeah, I, think, I think this is a good moment to just take, take a, uh, a second and say, how did Uptown Records begin Uptown, of course, being the, the New York local lingo for Harlem, where, where the sound came from, um, you know, what was your inspiration coming out of Rush and Def Jam in that world and, and creating Uptown? Um, I was a hip-hop artist who used to um, not just wear sne sneakers and jeans. I'd be dressed up sometimes First. because I'm from the park, so I've been rocking since I was 15 years old, shootouts and all like I was telling y'all. So sometimes I would have gigs after work. So I was a sales accountant for WWINS Talk Radio. So I'd be dressed, suit and tied up. And I lived in Queens. I didn't want to go home and then have to come back to Roseland to perform. So I would just stay in my suit and go up and start rocking. And they knew I was real, so I could do that. And so after a while, that became my image. Now, how I started Uptown Records is from being Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I was from the Bronx, and Mr. Hyde was from Harlem. And I would spend most of the time rocking in Harlem and picking up the whole Harlem style. The haircuts, the jewelry, the mock necks, the AJ Lester's, the whole, the quarter fields, the whole style thing. And I would sit there at King, King Tower's basketball tournament, and this was like a baby pro rucker. My DJ, Ronnie Green, he used to run it. So I would sit there, and the hustlers would come out with these teams. And I would look at how they were dressed. And I always said, imagine if young people could do this legally, have this kind of swag and attitude, like having a convertible Benz is nothing. Having a, on this $10,000 watch is nothing. And I said, if I ever start a record company, I'm going to make my artists be like that. Right. And I think, you know, I mean, I think Puffy obviously was a, a great example of that. Um, and I think, you know, and, and Teddy, obviously, you kind of personify the, the New Jack Swing image. You know, tell me a little bit about what that term meant to you when you first heard it, when you first started using it, applying it to yourself. Well, then, um, Brian Michael Cooper was like a media coach to me. He was kind of teaching me how to do interviews. So that's how we met, by him actually giving, doing an interview with me, but at the same time, just kind of showing me the things I need to say and, you know, when I need to not say much and and Brad you know, Cooper is the guy who wrote New Jack City. New Jack City, yes. And um, he actually gave me that name around the same time they were doing New Jack City writing. And uh, when he gave me that name, I, I ran with it. You know, I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't think it was going to be this big. Mm -hmm. And I just ran with it and just continued doing music and I still didn't have like a real sound. It was just coming into his form. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we uh, developed New Jack Swing. Along with um, Andre just giving me all of the artists to work with to test my sound. And uh, everything came out successful. 
We had number one records. Yep. Out the blue. Platinums. And uh, that was just me being a hungry kid from Harlem. Now, mm -hmm. Teddy used to make these records in his mother's living room in the projects. I would go to his house, hang out. I would watch him make the bass line first, and it'd be him or me, like from today. And then he'd put the drums. And then he would watch to see, you know, four or five people be there. He'd be watching how your head's moving. If your head is moving like this, he's adding more flavor to it. And like in 20 minutes, he'll have my prerogative playing, the basic skeleton of my prerogative playing. Like when I say somebody's gifted, to this day, I've never seen anybody as gifted musically as Teddy Riley. Wow, oh, thank you. Well, and uh, in addition, you've worked with some of the most gifted musicians out there as well, starting with the Jackson family from Janet to Michael. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, let's start with the Jacksons, because I didn't think I was going to make it to Michael. But, you know, I got to work with the Jacksons, and that was good for me. Um, but working on that record, I never got to meet Michael. You know, he just came for the video. He did his vocals alone. He didn't even do it with the brothers. Um, I did the vocals with the brothers, and uh, everything turned out great. And I was like, when are we going to meet Michael? What was that record? That was 2300 Jackson Street. And uh, when I did that record, I was like, yeah, I finished everything I had to do. I said, when I'm going to meet Michael? And I kept saying, when I'm going to meet Michael? And then that, I never got to meet him and wound up seeing the record, you know, the video on TV. I was like, man, this is messed up. <laughs> and then uh, I'd say three months later, it was around Christmas, because we did that record at the end of the summer. And then uh, around Christmas, Shane Griffin, my manager at the time, uh, we broke up. And when we broke up, um, I got a call from Quincy Jones. But before they broke up, let's go back a bit. They broke up after the Budweiser Superfest when Guy and New Edition were there. That is, that's right. I didn't want to go into that, but I'll, you I'll go into it. But <laughs> you want me to tell them? Well, there. There was an altercation between New Edition and Guy. Backline, not us, per se, the principals. Um, the backlines were fighting over the drums being set up around the same time we were on stage. And our road manager and production manager didn't like it. And they got into a fight backstage. While we were on stage, uh, we were singing Peace of My Love. And it's like a part where Aaron puts down a towel and he brings a girl you know, hefty girl on the stage, and he's picking her up and, and you know, doing the, you can have a piece of my love. And next thing you know, the guys from New Edition walk on the stage. And when they walked on the stage, we didn't know what was going on, but we heard the crowd just like going crazy. I thought it was because of Aaron picking up the big girl. <laughs> and it wound up being New Edition being on the stage, and they thought it was a part of our show. So the whole, like, you know, it sounded like the bleachers, you know, and it was, crazy. Next thing you know, Michael wanted to have, Mike Bivens wanted to have a conversation with me on the stage. I'm like, wait a minute, we got a show going on here. <laughs> but next thing you know, they wound up breaking everything up. We had to leave the stage. Everybody had to leave the stage and wound up losing my best friend the next day in Pittsburgh, you know, being shot, you know. And when that happened, it kind of messed up the whole tour. And this is all because of uh, somebody making a call, which was my ex-manager, and bought a bunch of goons and everything, and fighting was going on. And one of the guys from New Edition's crew, you know, wound up shooting my guy in the back four times and killing him on the spot. And when that happened, no one didn't care. I felt like no one didn't care because there was no flowers, nothing sent to the funeral. So I said, you know what? I'm going to quit. So my plan of quitting, all of this happened all in one week. I got a call from Michael Jackson on a Tuesday. Wednesday was a rehearsal with Guy. I went. I was physically, fleshfully there, but my mind and my spirit wasn't. Because all I was thinking was, Michael Jackson just called me. I said, I'm going to quit on Monday. Wednesday, I get to rehearse, so it's Damien's birthday. And his birthday party was that night. I wound up going back to the studio. 
because I said, I got a call from Michael Jackson yesterday. I'm going to make, work on some music. So the first record I worked on with Michael was the first track called Blood on the Dance Floor. And working on Blood on the Dance Floor, while that party was going on, I'm banging this record out. And this will remind you of the movie Fresh. If you've ever seen the movie Fresh, I'm banging out this music at, like I'm playing chess. And next thing you know, I get a call. Damien's bodyguard gets killed on the dance floor. Mm. And I'm working on a song called Blood on the Dance Floor. I didn't call it Blood on the Dance Floor that day. When I got to Michael with the music, he called it Blood on the Dance Floor, mm. not me. Mm. I just know that was the track in the first track that I worked on. And then uh, meeting Michael, it took me two weeks, because I said, give me two weeks, because I need the time to make, up, make the music and build some tracks for you. And I wound up doing about 50 or 60 tracks. How, how, how long did it take to do Michael Jackson's album? Oh, the whole album? It took about a year and three months and Michael with, Jackson, when I came on. Is Michael Jackson all-consuming? Like once, it, once you start producing, all your time belongs to him? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you, I, I, we were working on Remember the Time. And when we worked on Remember the Time, um, we got through the first verse. We did the intro, we got through the first verse, and next thing you know, Mike was happy, and he leaves the studio. He goes to his room. In fact, he, just to give you a, an idea of the studio he built for me, it's Larrabee Studios. He kind of gutted out a few of the rooms and built it around me and him and his cook. We had game room, pool room, everything. And uh, he built my bedroom because I told him I like to stay in the studio. I like to sleep there. Mm -hmm. So they built the bedroom for me and, and they built him a bedroom because he's never slept at a studio like that. Mm -hmm. He always went home. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I like this idea. So we stayed in the studio, I'd say literally four months before we left, you know, really? to go to a hotel. But I had a hotel room. He was paying for a hotel room for four months when he built me a bedroom and a shower and everything. I didn't need, I need, I didn't need to go. So I had a hotel room for four months and was being paid for and I'd never been there. And then finally I got a chance to go to the hotel room when the second verse was supposed to have been sung on Remember the Time. Michael Jackson takes a plane to Switzerland to, look, to go look at his new business, which is a shopping mall, shopping center. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm waiting for him to come back in the room for us to finish the song. And um, no Michael. So he calls me with, you know, the, the brick phone, you know, the. Mm -hmm. The big heavy first cell phone with mm -hmm. he calls me from the plane as he's about to uh, take off and he said Teddy I said yes Michael he said that was a great session right I said yes it was wonderful are you coming back to finish the verse he said um, I have to leave I said where he said I have to go to Switzerland to go see the shopping center and approve the stores that, you know, they built inside. And I said, Michael, I would like to go home too. He said, no, <laughs> you can't go, you can't, you can't leave. Don't be like the other guys. <coughs> I'm like the other guys. He said, yes, Dallas came and he just, he left without telling me and um, I'm so happy you mentioned, I'm gonna be back in about a week or so. I didn't see Michael for about two and a half weeks. <laughs> so I said, well, I miss my family. He said, bring them. <laughs> I said, well, I miss my friends too. He said, bring them too. <laughs> Listen, call Evie or call Norma, who was his uh, assistant mm -hmm. at the time, call them. and." He didn't wait for me to call them. He had them call me. Mm -hmm. What could I do for you, Mr. Rowley? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know what the budget is. He's, 
don't worry about the budget. What could I do? I said, well, my family and my friends are coming. They're going to need cars. OK. Where are we going to stay? Wherever you want to stay. So they put me in the Nico. Remember, the Nico is now the SLS. Mm -hmm. And they put me in there, and it was the indecent proposal room where they had the piano. And for me, and my, I had one daughter at the time, which was Deja, who he fell in love with. And uh, finally, two weeks came. Had all my fun with the family. He came back. In fact, he came to pick me up at the Nico. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we went to the studio. In fact, we went to go get some ice cream first. And then we went to the studio. And then we finished, remember the time. And I can remember him saying that this is going to be a smash. Because his terminology of smash is a record that is on the charts. That's more than five weeks. Number one. That's the smash. Oh, that's record the smash. On the chart. For one week or two weeks, you got a hit. And that's how he describes a smash. So uh, that's how we finished that song. And every song was sort of like, we have to wait for Michael. And on that first album that you, you produced with him, what was that album called? Dangerous. And did you produce the whole album? You might as well say. <laughs> um, how many records did that sell? Huh? How many records did that sell? Uh, it's over 34 million. Woo! Over 34 million. And um, in fact, when, when he passed, um, the sales went up even more. So I don't know where we're at right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have a, a Michael Jackson question for you. Um, a few years ago, I wrote this book called Michael Jackson, Inc., and you gave me one of my favorite stories, of, not just Michael stories, but anybody stories, and that was how you were going to give no diggity to Michael Jackson. So it, tell me how, what happened. <laughs> well. Did Michael hear no diggity? No. <laughs> it was just on my mind. You know how, I have to tell you, I used to steal songs from my artists and give them to, like, Heavy D. Heavy D would come, and, and I would let him hear records. And he'll, I'll say, this is for Rex. And he'll go, he'll listen, and he'll go. Next thing you know, he's writing the rap in his head like it's his. That's when you know somebody have favor. You know, they, he just came in, and he's like, um, everybody, shake your body. We don't care you know, at the party, moving. So I'm doing, we got our own thing for the Rex and the Fat. And he goes, that's mine, Ted, right? <laughs> I was like, no, it's, it's not, it's not. That's Rex, man. He's like, you got to give that to me, Ted. I mean, come on, man. We go way back when Flash used to rock on the beatbox. You got to give me that record. So I wound up giving, is it good to you? Now that we found love, and we got our own thing, we're Rex and the Fat songs. And I wound up giving it to Heavy because at that time, I thought it was too big for a Rex and Effect. And I, all I seen when Heavy, just in my presence, is this is yours. You can have it. And the same thing with Michael. Um, some of the songs that I did, I had other artists in mind, like another Key Sweat record or but I wind up giving it to Michael because, of course, y'all know he's the bigger artist. And uh, it would be bigger with him. So, you know, this happens, you know, with a lot of producers. You know, they have a song and it's made for their artist. And next thing you know, if a Michael Jackson or a Prince or somebody come or Beyonce, this is Beyonce's record. Mm -hmm. So that's how it goes, you know, with Michael. And there's been... Um, a lot of instances where Michael would call me into the meeting. I remember the first meeting, it was uh, the uh, marketing meeting. A Sony marketing meeting? Yes. OK. And Frank and DeLeo was his manager? No. Okay. It was uh, Sandy Gallen. Oh, Sandy Gallen. Okay. Yes. So the first meeting, I wasn't called to the meeting. And Michael was very upset that I wasn't called in that meeting. And then they stopped the meeting and actually came and got me from my room. And I went into the conference room, and they had all these pictures up on the table. 
And this is where I felt like, wow, I'm a, I'm a real part of this album. Because he says at the beginning of the meeting, I do not want, and this is how he says it, I do not want <laughs> anyone in this meeting and not tell Theodore, he calls me Theodore. <laughs> Theodore must be in every artist, marketing, I don't care. If it's my project, he's supposed to be in every meeting. So let's start. And he goes, Theodore, what do you think of these pictures? He says, which one do you think is the album cover? He's just asking me, which one do you think? And I said, none of them. He said, what do you mean? I said, none of them. That's not the album cover. The album cover is in your bedroom. When I went into his bedroom, and every time I go to his bedroom, he was working on the collage. You seen the collage? He made that life size like this, and he had it all standing up. That's why we have a limited edition of the Dangerous album where it's 3D and it lifts up like a collage. So he, he was making this in his room with paper, bending it, taking stuff and pieces from a magazine, like how we used to do in art class. And he would make this collage. And I said, wow, that's nice. And he would just practice. Like, it would open. I was like, what is he doing this for? So that's, that was the album cover. He agreed with you right away when you said that? All the way. He's like, that's the album cover. These are the insides. So you've seen all his face where he's looking at you and it looks, and when you walk that way, it looks like he's still looking at you. That was the scariest picture. <laughs> but that was the major picture when you open up the book and you see that. And then um, the picture with him with a t-shirt on. That was my idea as well, because he asked me, how do you want me, how should I dress for Keep It In The Closet? Because this is going to be the first single after black and white. Mm -hmm. So I said, you should show your features. People have never seen you under your jackets and your coats, and you should put your hair back. And he put his hair back, and he had his t-shirt on, and that's when I really felt like I'm, I'm a part of Michael's life now. Like, I couldn't wait to call the projects, call everybody. Like, the first person I called was my little brother, Markel, from Rex and Effect. And uh, I said, I said, yo, you got to hear this record. So I'm whispering to him, and next thing you know, we usually blast, a, you know, blast in the studio. Michael likes his music louder than me. So I played the record, and my brother's like, that's a hit. I said, no, it's a smash. That's what Michael said. <laughs> He said, I love it. I can't wait to hear it's finished. And because all we had on it was mumbles, you know. Mm -hmm. That was the time before we started working on the record. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent two weeks with Michael before we even got into the studio. And I was so anxious to get in the studio. I didn't think we was going to work. And uh, so during I, that two weeks, what was y'all doing? He was actually asking me so many questions to get to build my studio, he was asking me the things that I like. And he was asking me, you know, do you like, you know, spotlights and, you know, uh, LED lights and changing colors and all of that, you know? I said, yeah, all of that is great. What type of speakers you like? I like um, Asperger's. He said, okay. What do you like as far as small speakers? I like the venture stuff. I like Yamaha NS10s, and I like the R tones, which are the very small ones. but there were some other speakers that Michael and I liked, and they were from Radio Shack. They were called the Realistics. You remember the Realistics and, speakers? And, and that's what radio sounds like. Yeah. That's what the record sounds like coming over radio. Mm -hmm. So they were little, little small, little three-inch, four-inch speakers. And we would blow these things. And he's like, just buy 10, 10 pairs. <laughs> and we would mix the songs on these little speakers. And uh, I told him everything I like, and within two weeks, everything was built in that studio. I told him the type of board I like. And in the room that I wanted to be in, there was a Neve. I said, I love SSL. They took the Neve out, 
put in the SSL. And all of these things, you know, that they were doing, it took about two weeks to do. Well, actually, it takes longer, but Michael was like, I need it done in two weeks. And anything Michael asks for, he gets it. So Larrabee, you know about Larrabee Studios with Kevin and the guys and Coco, who tuned the speakers. Those guys built his studio, and then Michael had them rebuild my studio with the same stuff in Virginia. So the future studios, when it was time to mix the songs, he sent me back to Virginia with the Asperger speakers in it and the walls and everything. And I was like, wow. How, and you know, he wow. brought me that as a gift. Want, he didn't want to be involved in the mixing? No, he said, I want. So Michael carries a dat bag, a bag full of dats, which are all his references from like songs that Babyface and Quincy and everybody have worked on. So those are his references. If you don't meet those that references, he sends you back to the drawing board and you have to start all over. He wants to make sure that the record he, he, doesn't lose the essence of the demo. There you go. Say that in the mic. He said, I, Michael wanted to make sure that the, 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 fi the finished record didn't, didn't lose the energy of the reference track, the beginning, yeah. the demo. And that's what Michael goes by every time. He does it to Quincy, and uh, I think one time Quincy got so mad at him, he said, F the dat. He said, F that. <laughs> I said, man, I would never say that to Michael. <laughs> but they have a long-term relationship, you know. But uh, at one point, I used to, I was afraid in the beginning to tell Michael he was off key. You know, like, how do you tell Michael that, you know? <laughs> until one day he just pulled me to the side again and he said, don't be afraid to tell me when I'm off. Tell me if I smell, you my friend. And when, I, when he told me that, that was it for me, you know. Well, uh, we're running a little low on time. I wanted to, to bring it up to present day and then um, take questions until we get kicked off. Uh, you know, if that's cool with you guys. Uh, but to bring it to, to present day, you know, I think probably all of you out there may have noticed on Twitter, I think it was last week, there was this whole kerfuffle, uh, you, you might want to call it. Uh, Bruno Mars it was trending on Twitter. Why was Bruno Mars trending on Twitter? Um, because these sort of allegations of, of uh, cultural appropriation had popped up over songs like Uptown Funk. And, you know, there was this question whether acts like, you know, from Bruno Mars to Robin Thicke, you know, can use sort of the, the um, New Jack Swing sound uh, credibly. And of course, you know, Bruno, when he won his Grammys this year, thank you on stage. So I wanted to, to bring that to you guys to, to hear your reaction. Well, let me start off by saying, uh, Bruno Mars is one of my favorite artists, period. Yeah. And now I'm gonna tell you a little story. You know how Bruno Mars first came out with all the pop records? I had saw him at his first performance in New York. My friend Leroy Cohen was the chairman of Warner Brothers. He brought me down to see him. So, you know, I checked him out. I knew he was a good musician. I didn't necessarily love all those songs from the first album. And then I would see him at different, different places. Like, he performed at the Atlantic Records Grammy party. And when he did, he would always want to break into a set of BBD. <laughs> and he wanted to do some new edition songs. So um, when it came time to make this album, he's uh, sitting at the Soho house having a cigarette by the bathroom. I left my dinner table to go to the bathroom. So I see Bruno Mars. We don't know each other like that, but we know each other in passing. So I said, hey. He said, hey. I go to the bathroom. I come out. He's still sitting there by himself. I said, oh, he wants an Andre Harrell conversation. I have conversations all the time with artists to tell them what I think they should do. So. I sat down with him and I said, well, what you gonna do? He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, when I see you, you always wanna perform black records. And now that you made Uptown Funk and you just performed it on the Super Bowl, I know you wanna go back to the monkey thing. And he said, he was laughing at me when I said that. I said, you should go black. Matter of fact, you should go baby, you should go see Babyface right now and get it out your system. <laughs> so, so, 
That Monday, it was Saturday night I saw him. That Monday, he went to Babyface's house for six weeks and worked on his album. And Babyface called me and said, I know you sent him over here. <laughs> he said, but I, I, I don't really have to do nothing for him. He got it. He got it, got it. So um, when he paid homage to Teddy Riley by making that New Jack Swing song, that song was the theme song from Living Color, and my artist Heavy D and Eddie F had originally done that song. So he has always treated me great, made sure I have seats to all his shows. So he is not what I would call, what is the term? An appropriator? Uh, appropriator, culture vulture. A cult no, he is absolutely not a culture vulture. He's Spanish. He's almost black. He's Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's just good for the music. I think, I think uh, whenever mainstream pop stars do niche music, it brings the niche music to the forefront again. And I think he makes other artists, young artists, want to come and try that music. So for me, I think it's a compliment. It is in a big way, you know. The song is amazing. It sounds like a bunch of collages of music. That's New Jack Swing. But at the same time, his style is in there. And the one thing about Bruno is he's never afraid. You know, when you get artists with heart, like Bruno and Weekend and uh, Beyonce and Rihanna, who's not afraid to put out a record and think about, you know, that, how is this going to sound? It's going to be a hit or whatever. They're not afraid. They just go with it. And I always say to everybody, it's not how good you are. It's not how great you are. It's always how you look doing it. It's how you look doing it. So he looks the part. And he stands behind all his music. That's the one thing that sets him apart from a lot of artists, he looks the part. He knows how to do the dances. He puts on the outfits. Yes. He goes all the way with it. He makes a movie out of it. <laughs> and that, that's what it's about, you know. When Guy came out, we looked like New Jack Swing with the MC, MCM suits. You know, Dapper Dan, 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 Dapper Dan, who, actually, now, who now down with Gucci. Yes. Back Thirty years ago, he was down with Teddy Riley and Guy. He's still. I'm, I got the Essence outfit. He's doing. He's doing my whole Essence. Well, we're doing Essence. Teddy Riley and friends. Yeah. New Jack Swing. <laughs> to the fullest. I got some surprises for y'all. It's gonna blow y'all minds. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. But this is the time where I gotta let loose. I gotta let Uptown come all the way out on that stage, and. Uh, Hopefully I get to get my man Diddy there and everybody who want to see it firsthand, you know, because um, Guy is going to be there, Black Street's going to be there, um, Kumo D, Rex and Effect, and uh, Big Buck with Today. And then um, I'm, I'm trying to have a High Five there. Um, and also Bobby Brown, yeah. Keith Sweat. Um, and I just got the commitment from Keith to do it, and uh, we can ready to turn this mother sucker out. We can ready to kill That's it. Right. Um, and then we have another surprise. I can't tell y'all who it is, but it's the actual last part of the show. And it can't get no bigger than Michael Jackson, right? Okay, then. <laughs> so I look forward to y'all seeing it. If y'all don't see it, it's going to be filmed and probably put on one of the uh, networks, but it's gonna be nice. And we go on right before Janet Jackson and right after Fantasia. So it's gonna be a night to remember. And that's the last night, that's the Sunday night at the Essence Festival. That's right, the eighth. All right, well, I think that brings the panel portion to a close. Do we have time for a couple questions? A couple questions, okay. Uh, I think we can all hear each other. Just we got uh, right, so a hand over there, right there. Yep. Okay, my name is Sassy Black, and that's a funky fact. I made an album called New Black Swing. I'm not gonna waste nice. my shot. Like Hamilton, I'm out here for real. Okay, I'm from Seattle. My dad's from Harlem and the Bronx. He taught me all about you my whole life. Nice. So you're a big inspiration. I just think Beyonce's gonna come out with a new Jack Swing album, and I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if she calls you yet. Because if she ain't, she bows to. <laughs> well. 
I hope Beyonce take a shot at New Jack Swing because I think with her, she can actually do what Janet did and make some smashes, you know, because she have that versatility and she has a, a well-round incredible voice. And so, she got that bounce. Yes, she do. And that's what New Jack Swing is about. All right, right over here. Yep. Hi, Teddy. Hi. Um, how are you? So first of all, I, I want to tell you, Dangerous was the first album I ever had as a child. Wow. And I want to thank you for being solely responsible for shaping the landscape of my musical consciousness and well-being. Thank you. So for, I want to thank you for that. My question to you is, as an aspiring producer, what is the biggest piece of advice that you give to young people who want to be be different. Be different. Be innovative. Don't do what's on the radio. You know, and uh, I've been turned away. It took me four years to actually get a record deal. You know, from kids at work to, well, actually, we called ourselves fame first, and then kids at work, and then guy. And um, with the album cover you got there, right there, there's the original member, uh, Timmy Gatlin. Oh, no problem. That's no problem. But uh, yeah, I can tell you just be different because what we did and what I was influenced, you know, being around Andre, he'll make you be different. It's like, nah, I just got to make that a little funky and you got to go here and there and, and give me them drops that, you know, that's the famous thing. Andre used to always be like, I need the drops on these records, man. Put the drops on it. And, and back then, it was everything was so manual. I needed more than my 10 fingers. So I had, you know, Heavy D, Eddie F, everybody would have a finger on, on the actual uh, buttons. And next thing you know, it's like one, two, three, drop. And we, then we bring the music back in. And we were doing that manually. And then all of our edits, when you hear that stuff go back, back to back, we'll actually literally be cutting tape, two inch tape. So I say be different. Keep your music to yourself. Don't put it online, you know, unless you're putting it out. I just really feel like a lot of musicians are giving away their content. And that's, we didn't have that back then. And I know sometimes it's good, but if you got some records to throw away, yeah, throw those up there. But don't throw the records that you think is gonna be for Michael or whoever, a major artist, keep those. Uh, right here. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much for sharing your black excellence and your genius. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, and I missed your concert in Pittsburgh because I was here. You sure did. Only because I was here, but you see, I'm here for you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, truly, I think that Andre Harrell and I should do a New Jack Swing movie. Yes. I, well, I don't think so, and, and I, I held it back this long. Uh, I, we did the treatment. Actually, Jeff Dyson and I did the treatment because it's the whole new edition and guy uh -huh. situation. Are you coming from that point? Coming from his point and mine. Uh, okay. But it starts with me being, starting out young, when I started playing instruments at the age of three and four, all the way up to now, a series. 35 years of just everything about New Jack Swing and how it came about. When I got picked up on the stage with Gladys Knight, she picked me up on the stage at the age of five, and I knew then I wanted to be a star. Where and, were you uh, at, at five years old? Did she the Apollo. <laughs> I went to the Apollo. My, my babysitters took me because I wanted to see Gladys Knight. My mom and my father used to play Gladys Knight and the Pips every day. If we take a trip somewhere, it's Gladys Knight, it's James Brown, and Al Green. That was the whole ride, 11 hours to South Carolina. So I was influenced by that, and I, I just started playing that in my life have been nothing but trying to put artists together because that was my dream. And when they didn't do it, I did it. 
I took James Brown style, put it with Prince and put it with everybody and just make it all a collage of music. That's what New Jack Swing is about. Heavy R&B, all in one bag. All right, well, we've got time for one more right there. saying songwriting process. Well, there's so many ways to write songs, you know. I can tell you from my point of view, I've written a song every way you could imagine. Even from using the toilet tissue with the microphone stuck in the middle to make that my bass drum, because I, I couldn't afford a drum machine. So I used that and started doing the beatbox, so it was like this. And I would put that as my first track. And then I'll start making music on top of it with my little Casio. So I started like that, ended up doing it the right way, where it's a piano and a singer. And we just play, and we go over melodies. And it's almost like a puzzle. You're just singing different melodies, and I'm playing to it. And uh, I find that being the best way, because you can always make a beat if you're a beat maker. But you can't always make a record if you're not a player. So I start that way, or I start with a bass, drum, a, a bass guitar or a bass drum. And uh, there's so many different ways. But the fun way is, when I did the, the Black Street album, the same way I worked with Michael, because I took that same formula, and I worked with Black Street, and I had everybody in the room, the writers and the singers. And I'm the piano player. And I'm playing some lines, and next thing you know, that's how we got Don't Leave. I'll play some lines, and we'll get, you know, Before I Let You Go. Or we'll get No Diggity from just that little sample. So that is the way to really pick up. That's the fun way, where you have a bunch of people around, and everybody's giving you ideas. And we wrote that whole album in less than two months, the Another Level album. All right, well, I think that is a great note to end on. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank give you. it up for Andre Harrell and give it up for Teddy Riley. Thank I'm Zach Amela Greenberg. Enjoy the rest of your South by.